back to the Farmer to Farmer 5 live stream. We're back here in Omaha having very exciting conversations about the future of crops, the future specifically on this panel about regenerative. So I'm going to pass to you guys. First of all, give us a little introduction. Who are you? Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Doug Pollan. I'm a farmer out of North Central Kansas. Uh, uh, been doing no-till practices there since uh, the early 90s, I guess, so 25, 26 years ago, and uh, really excited about regenerative ag and, and uh, have a diversified uh, grain operation, uh, corn, beans, sorghum, oats, wheat, uh, hay, hay uh, some cattle and stuff, and uh, uh, that's where we're at. So. Absolutely, and welcome back. Yeah, Darren Lickfeld, I'm the head of agronomy here at Farmers Business Network, where we put together a team of agronomists that, um, that I put together that can consult with farmers, uh, members who are considering these various practices. Often they're very nervous about trying something like this. Is this gonna hurt my pocketbook if I do this? Uh, or how will this benefit me financially versus benefit the environment if I do this? So from an agronomy standpoint, we give our members consultation in that regard, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Now Regenerative is something, it's a bit of a buzzword. We hear yeah. a lot about it all the time. Farmers are curious about it. Um, you know, I think consumers are really curious about it. Let's start kind of at the top. What does regenerative agriculture mean? Yeah. You want me to go? Yeah, okay. good. We'll get right here. I'm not sure I like the term. We'll use it because it's good to be very common because it's to regenerate something means you've degraded it in some way. And I'm not sure farmers are purposely degrading anything. Now, some of the practices we do are degradative degradative to the environment. Soil health, for instance, a lot of tillage practices were not beneficial. Now we've learned mm -hmm. that and we're trying to adjust uh, back to that. But so regen works. I like the sustainability concept. Mm -hmm. um, if something is sustainable, it will last long, uh, long term mm -hmm. and we can sustain things for more of the long term. As I've told you yesterday, Sarah, to me, to be sustainable also means to be needs to be economical because if Doug goes out of business, um, that's not sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. So, for our industry, for that to happen, um, but they're kind of catchphrases. Soil health gets looped into that. Organic production gets looped into that. Nutrient density is something that's a hot topic now, and that's gotten looped into that. I'd like to kind of distinguish some of those things myself, mm -hmm. but that's the scientist in me coming out. Yeah. So. yeah. And from the farmer's perspective, Doug? Yeah, I think the idea is that we're, um, we recognize that from the resource of particularly the soil that we have degraded it primarily with tillage over the years and, and, and exhausted it a bit. And so I think the focus now in regenerating is that we recognize that sustaining this level of degradation isn't, is no longer um, maybe ideal. Let's focus on regenerating it and making it better from a soil health standpoint, from a productivity standpoint. And really kind of the preface of that is understanding more of the cultural practices, uh, cropping diversity, rotations, those types of things. Use of cover crops is certainly very popular now. And so that we understand how to put all that stuff together to, again, not just sustain a level, but rather regenerate and build uh, a more resilient, a more uh, profitable system. Uh, so that's what I kind of take from regenerative on the surface. Sure. Now you've been involved in no-till for a long time. I'm curious if, to learn a little bit more about how you got there. I think pretty early on, yeah. comparatively, and then also, uh, where do you go from here? What's your next step? Yeah. So, a um, little run back. Yeah. So graduated from college, had an opportunity to come back and take over the crop production side on the family farm, and and recognize as a young producer that um, uh, that was a. Uh, a great opportunity but kind of wanted to do a little bit different and so had some exposure working as an agronomist a bit in an internship before I graduated and had some exposure to differing areas and more cropping diversity and so when I came back to the farm I really wanted to focus on adding diversity to the operation and as a young producer with with no money it made a lot of sense that I would take a, a farm that had maybe one crop and add two or three or four and and uh, so that's what kind of got me into it and and, and understood that no-till uh, was an important part of adding, adding diversity because you could conserve extra moisture and grow more high water use crops in my region. So, um, so that's kind of how it started and built and got pretty involved with an organization that was just getting launched in Kansas or that area called No-Till on the Plains real early on. I've been, uh, I've had a great time there uh, serving on the board of directors for really all this time and, and uh, helping with educational programs about no-till and, and sharing stories with other farmers and, and learning. So that's a little bit where we have come from, I guess. And so uh, I've really had a lot of um, 
over these 20 plus years have seen no-till farming systems change from just mm -hmm. talking about equipment changes to, to introduction of cover crops or integration to livestock and, and building the soil and understanding more about the soil biology and stuff. So it's all exciting Absolutely. to me. I want to get both of your guys' perspectives on this because I feel like I've, I've met so many farmers like you, Doug, who have made some kind of switch, who are doing some kind of regenerative practice and have seen real economic benefits. Mm -hmm. And yet I still Eventually, a, not up front. But yeah. that, <laughs> might be, that might be the key <laughs> to this conversation because my question is, why is it such a hard sell still? Why, are, why is there so much resistance still? Yeah. How would I ask Doug, you know, when you decided to switch to no-till, was it an all-out switch on a Tuesday you woke up and said, yeah. I'm going to switch um, because that, it's a slow process and yeah. those first few years could actually hurt your pocketbook, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, because yeah. of the litter you're leaving on a field right, yeah. and the soils are slower to warm up and yeah. so I got to plant a little later yeah. maybe. Yeah. Um, but once you coach yeah. through that, I mean, people come to embrace it, I think. Yeah, so. yeah. So everybody manages that transition differently. In my case, it was pretty much kind of full on right from the start. Did we you? just took tillage out. And I think that's important that you understand maintaining both of those systems is actually maybe even much more costly because some of the benefits of, of a diversified yeah. no-till system is that you can reduce some of, the, some of the equipment overhead and the labor part. And so, um, so yeah, in my case, it was fairly rapid. Uh, kind of immediate, but everybody will make that transition uh, mm -hmm. probably at their own base. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and I'd say with, with more and more rented ground being out there, if I don't own this land, more sustainable practice are, are frankly a little less attractive to me, I mean, to be honest, mm -hmm. where um, not that necessarily they're not beneficial, but if I might not be renting this ground next year, mm -hmm. something that's going to cost me this year and it's not going to give me a long-term benefit, it's a decision the growers got to make, right? Mm -hmm. to, Decide that. So, yeah. I want to hear. I think one of the things I hear from farmers a lot as well is about a special. You know, 2019 not the greatest year. Not a lot of great years in the recent past. Some challenging years probably ahead still. And I think a lot of farmers. I, I mentioned this earlier. Look at things like organic and regenerative and some of these practices and say like this isn't the time to to take that risk. This isn't the time to. To, this is the time to sit back a little and play defense. What, mm -hmm. it, is, what, what's happening there? Yeah. Kind of, mm -hmm. was I'd love that your to hear your perspective. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think that, um, I don't know, that time for change will be different for everybody. It's always difficult. I, I, I don't think that, uh, uh, yeah, I just, I guess I wouldn't discourage anything. I, you know, everybody's going to embrace that at a different level and just educate yourself. The yeah. thing that I've found the most uh, comfort in is, is sharing stories with other farmers. I mean, I, I enjoy traveling, uh, meeting new people, sharing stories, and I think that's what's uh, valuable about supporting anybody in a change system. So uh, I just really feel strongly about that it's the right focus and direction for the future of agriculture. And I think we're in, getting into a day and age where we're certainly uh, with social media, the information yeah. Exchange is much more much fluid easier. now, yeah. and and that's while that is challenging in many cases, I think that's an opportunity uh, uh, to distinguish uh, different systems and be able to to take that information mm -hmm. to the consumer. And, and so I think that there's a thirst there, and and, and, a, and I think the time is right. On well, the universities, we're certainly ahead of us, encouraging our producers to go this direction. I've really been encouraged. The scientist in me loves to get quantitative about it, so switching to no-till is the beneficial thing to do. Why? And start asking the, the five questions, why, 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 as if you're a four-year-old in some ways, right? Like, why? Well, your organic carbon content will go up. How's that beneficial? Why? You know, mm -hmm. I can hold more nutrients longer, which has an economic benefit. If I can improve my water infiltration rates through the soil, how is that? And you can measure those. There's devices mm -hmm. to measure that mm -hmm. now. It means less runoff into the creek, the river, the stream, down to the Gulf of Mexico. So. Mm -hmm. Um, getting real quantitative with how am I improving it and measuring that improvement over time, I think really helps encourage guys to stick with it long term. So. I want to talk about the economics there as well because I think, yes, on the agronomy side, I hear a lot about it. There's a lot of research. USDA has gotten into it a mm -hmm. bit. The university has, has certainly gotten into quantifying some of these practices. And then consumers are trying to help too. Mm -hmm. Consumers are looking for labels. Mm -hmm. They're looking for... Mm -hmm. closer relationships with farmers. They're trying to understand mm -hmm. how to s 
provide an economic support for farmers to do this. I, they certainly weren't doing that yet 20 years ago. Yeah, no. Um, and I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit to how that's changed and how um, maybe, Dr. Darren, maybe you can speak to how, how, do you think it'll continue to change? I think so, especially as the consumer demand on labeling and whatnot is asking for more sustainable practices. That's going to drive demand all the way back to the field, right? Mm -hmm. And so within FBN, we're looking at ways that if Doug takes on a practice and economically it might be a short-term expense for you, long-term you're going to get a premium somehow for that crop because you took this practice. And you should be rewarded for doing the right thing, right, mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways. Or even cover crops, we haven't really talked about them yet. A lot of growers, unfortunately, still look at a cover crop as a cost Mm -hmm. with benefits that are harder to quantify. Well, we're exploring ways if you could make cash on your cover crop, then mm -hmm. and ultim ultimately that turns into a cash crop as well. You know, it's a little easier to embrace, right? <laughs> if I can do that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Well, Doug, talk, yeah. talk a little bit about that premium. What, what does it look like on the farmer yeah. end? Uh, I don't know. It, 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 you know, we've had that conversation for, for quite a while or within groups or friends or peers that, that I'm involved with, they have that conversation. We've had it for a long time. I, I, I hope that we can identify a method with which we can, um, we can, we can take that to the marketplace. And, and, and I'm uh, really excited about Farmers Business Network and what they do and this network of farmers and it's growing and, and the information that, that they have or we have as members about our operations and other other members and so I think maybe this might be a platform that that we can uh, package up that information and, and go to a consumer group or go to a company that's interested in 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 in, uh, in having a sustainability label or or part of their portfolio will be that way and, and can prove that hey we've got these producers that are doing these practices and and uh, and if there's a, a marketplace which I think there is for that uh, we can move that. I don't know that it's maybe going to be a direct premium back to us, but I think it ultimately um, there's value there, and maybe ultimately it's maybe not a premium for that, but a discount for not doing that. Sure. I've heard kind of whispers, particularly around the edge, about things like water quality markets, carbon markets, those kind of things. Are those? Are you keeping kind of that in? Where where do those kind of considerations? Obviously, they're a long way off still. Is that part of the cal long-term calculation a bit? Uh, I don't know. I mean, they've had those conversations for a long time, <laughs> and, and it doesn't seem like any of those programs come to fruition or, or really ultimately have, have stuck. I mean, I not to discourage building those programs or, or designing them. I mean, we're probably doing something similar and trying to kind of package up a, a systems approach. Uh, but I don't know, so I'm certainly aware of those and following them. But I think it sure might be a little right easier model. on the water side, frankly. Carbon se sequestration is something, how do you quantify that? Am I yeah. carbon neutral? And yeah. to be carbon neutral benefited me as a grower in what way? Um, whether mm -hmm. it's economics or environmental, mm -hmm. uh, climate change, per, mm -hmm. from a climate change perspective. Um, and there's some, and, and even the research community would argue that, you know, are we carbon positive or negative or neutral there's no conclusive, mm -hmm. you know, I guess it depends on the practices. And we certainly at FBN support yeah. the research to mm -hmm. dive into that more. Uh, but ultimately, we'd like to make the tie so if, if somebody is invested in an FBN membership, we want to get them tied maybe to a premium, a contract where they can get a premium because they've done the right thing mm -hmm. from a regenerative, sustainable standpoint. So. <laughs> well, let me talk about the other end kind of risk there. You talked a little bit about in the first couple of years, you know, you might see a little bit of an economic hit. but I. There's just a hint of research out there right now. I mean, some of these regenerative practices, regenerative practices just haven't been around for that long or right. haven't been used at scale for a mm -hmm. long time. Right. And there's some, you know, hint that maybe cover crops, you know, the return plateaus or declines at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, what do we do? How do you, and maybe from the farmer's perspective, how do you take that kind of information? You know, when you see, like, K-State has just come out with a new study and it doesn't look good. I mean, you can't, mm -hmm. do you give up? your practice that you've been working mm -hmm. on? Do you alter your plan? What mm -hmm. do you do with that info? Yeah, I think it's, it's certainly challenging because the, uh, uh, the, the system is very complicated and so we have to understand, I just focus on how the crop 
types fit together and it's kind of a whole package like people ask you well, what's your most profitable crop you know it's while well, that changes from year to year I can't do the whole farm to one crop or I mean it's not doesn't make sense so it all fits together and, and yeah it is complicated to quantify but 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 I think we have to do what we can to to recognize those values and to to build towards that direction of, a, of building the system building the soil um, and while being sustainable economically and socially and environmentally. Yeah. Are you, are you worried? Do you think that there's a possibility that there's un, in, unanticipated consequences out there to, to some of these regenerative practices? Um, I wouldn't say anxious or worried about it. I think in an organization like FBN now, it's been around five years plus, we've got data scientists, we have agronomists who can help filter and separate the wheat from the chaff and say, here's a good study. This one's more credible than that one, and put a, a quality standard on studies because there's a lot of studies that just are not necessarily credible, and we need to provide Doug with guidance mm -hmm. that we feel from a science standpoint stands up to rigor um, and discipline filtering of what makes the most sense. Because particularly, say if something was done in Australia, does that not make sense in Kansas? Might not, right? I mean, we got to separate those things out. And, um, yeah. 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 I think we have to focus on the principles of what, of the system and, and how it all fits together, whether it's in Australia or Kansas or Iowa or whatever. We, I think we understand the principles and how they work together and move towards that. I think there's lots of value there. Absolutely. Right. And separating yeah. out what are the, so you say soil health, there's a lot of disagreement even as to how we measure soil health, yeah. right? And there's a whole academic community that's looking at what's the right test. Mm -hmm. And those tests often will comprise several things, microbial life, carbon contents, infiltration rates. Ultim and that will generate an index number. So here's your index number for your soil health. Did it go up or down? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like breaking that out a little more into infiltration rates, carbon contents, microbial life. And there's there are separate tests you can do for those mm -hmm. components. Mm -hmm. um, and then break out what is really the most important. Mm -hmm. Is it carbon? Is it, you know, uh, both? You look at uh, Iowa and the controversies over uh, the water quality through Des Moines, um, is that a year ago, two years ago? Yeah. You know, that's not gone away, yeah. and if we don't take proactive measures to fix that as a farming, in, as, a, as an agricultural industry, regulations are going to mandate that, then guess what? Yeah, we're going to be doing all this in a much bigger way, yeah. you know? So I'm yeah. encouraged that um, farmers like Doug are looking at that themselves. And if asked, he can point to pro programs and things he's currently doing mm -hmm. um, yeah. that, you know, would say, I don't necessarily need more regulation and that this thing is, you know, we are fixing it in many ways ourselves. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to get your final thoughts in just like maybe one sentence. If a farmer is interested in regenerative but doesn't know where to start, mm. where do you start? Yeah. For, again, I mentioned in, uh, involved in No-Till on the Plains organization, but that's out of Kansas. We have a, a big conference that's coming up the end of January in Wichita, Kansas. Extraordinary uh, place to hear from farmers and researchers about that system. So I just encourage you to, to study and learn and share, and that's a great place to get that information. I would say the No-Till community is overall, there's the, there's the Eastern No-Till, they have a No-Till conference every year. I don't remember the exact name of it. It might just be the No-Till Association. Or um, but you get a lot of the most uh, innovative minds at that, it seems, and a lot of consolidation of ideas at the No-Till type conferences. There'll be sugar, I mean, cover crop sessions. There'll be soil health sessions. The No-Till community is a great place to get engaged in, to learn a lot more, and reputable information, too, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Great advice. Great. Thank you so much for joining us again.